started. Thank you guys for attending tonight. Uh, welcome to the Federation of Neighborhoods Community Forum on the mall redevelopment and the future of the Atlanta Highway Corridor. Uh, the Federation of Neighborhoods uh, presents forums for residents to learn more about local issues. Uh, we are an independent and nonpartisan community organization uh, in athens Clark County. Uh, our membership uh, includes neighborhood associations, other community organizations, and individual members. Our forums are always free and open to the public. And uh, please consider becoming an individual affiliate member uh, or encouraging your neighborhood uh, association to become a member. And we want to thank CNA, thank you Nick, uh, for the support of this forum and by providing this lab space at a discount. Uh, tonight's forum uh, will be focused on the Atlanta Highway Corridor and the mall redevelopment project. We will begin tonight with a few uh, moderator questions and then we'll open up the floor to Q&A from the audience. Before we begin, uh, a few ground rules. Uh, uh, this is an open and accepting space, so please be respectful of the panelists and your neighbors. Uh, no jeering or cheering. And then uh, when we get to the Q&A portion where we accept questions from the floor, uh, please remember to phrase your questions as questions, uh, not statements. And I'll remind you. <laughs> uh, so uh, I will be your moderator tonight. Uh, my name is Buck Bacon. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, I, I serve on the board here with the Federation of Neighborhoods, but I also have the pleasure of working with WNA Engineering and the Better Communities Collaborative. So I'm going to let Scott do all of the answering, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut uh, and just, just throw out questions. Uh, all right, well, I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to uh, introduce yourself. Ms. Linda, is it okay if we start with you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I should be able to do that. <laughs> so I am Linda Davis. I am uh, representative of District 3. This is my district on the school board. And I have been uh, a member of the school board since 2012. So I'm going in my 11th year in that, in that role. Uh, you may better know me as the Brooklyn Friends of Brooklyn Cemetery Coordinator. Don't want to miss that opportunity. <laughs> there you go. Hi, my name is. Uh, is it working? Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Well, okay. That's fine. Yeah. We have all learned to pivot in the last three years, so here we are pivoting. Um, my name is Mumby Anderson, and I am a district, the District Six representative on the Board of Education. I have served in that role for the last three years, um, and I am super excited to be, well, I was super excited to be on the MARC committee, which, you know, sort of helped uh, move along the boat for this redevelopment. Um, lots of discussions were had about the community benefits agreement, et cetera, through that MARC committee, and then it moved up to athens Clark County uh, government, and so I served on that committee along with Ms. Davis. Good evening. I'm Scott Haynes. Uh, I'm a landscape architect. I work for WNA Engineering. Uh, there, I'm the director of operations for the Athens office. I also lead the landscape architecture and planning department. Uh, for this particular project, the mall, I was on the team um, as lead for developing the plan, and also worked quite a bit on the TAD and CBA as well. Hello, I am Jesse Hool. I'm on the county commission, representing District Six, which, broadly speaking, is West Athens, but it includes all of the Atlanta Highway Corridor outside the loop, including the, the mall, which we'll be talking about today. Um, it's good to see some faces in the crowd from neighborhoods that aren't often in the rooms. So thanks for coming out. Um, and it's also, I've been to a lot of these, but it's nice to be on this side of the room and also odd. It's the, the topography of this side is much higher in strength. So thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, well, thank you guys. Uh, what, I, I know there are going to be a lot of acronyms thrown out tonight. So, uh, Jesse, I want to start with you. Do you know all the acronyms? Can you, can you introduce the acronyms for us? I could list more of them than anyone wants to know. But <laughs> the, the key ones. I think, if, okay, I, yeah, well, I, 
realize it would be the acronym dictionary. Um, yeah. Okay, so you know, one major one we'll probably talk about today is TADS, Tax Allocation Districts. Uh, there's six of them in Athens, uh, only one of which also includes participation by the school board uh, or the Clark County School District so that their taxes and the county's taxes are involved, and that's this one, the mall one. Um, these are little geographies, little um, regions that are drawn up um, where a special tax is levied. Mm -hmm. And is now the time to explain what that is, or is that later in this We can talk about that later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you might hear us reference the MARC, that's the Mall Area Redevelopment Committee. That's one of two layers of bureaucracy this project moved through outside of the conventional planning commission to the mayor and commission. Um, there's also the TAC, or the TAD Advisory Committee. Um, so basically there's like what you can think of as more like citizen representatives, um, and business owners in the area that are on the TAC. I see um, at least uh, one of whom in the room. And, um, uh, and then after they reviewed the project, um, the TAD proposal specifically, it went to the MARC, the Mall Area Redevelopment Committee, and that's comprised of myself, Commissioner Hamby, Mayor Gertz, and the two school board members you see seated here. Um, I don't know if there are other acronyms you really want. Oh, CVA? Yeah, PD, okay. Uh, so PD, you're probably familiar with hearing referring to the police department, but in this case, we'll probably be referring to a planned development, uh, which is a specific type of proposal that comes through the Planning Commission where the design is very restricted. Um, all the way down to where a bench is placed is, if it's on that plan, it's gonna be built. So um, when, someone com when someone comes to the Planning Commission with a planned development, it's kind of like an even more specific version of a binding site plan where whatever is approved really has to be built. Different than like when someone's just looking for a rezone and they can build anything that meets our code in that zone. Um, and then a CBA, you might hear us refer to as a community benefits agreement. That's a term that can be used to apply to a lot of different things, uh, but in this case it refers to the agreement between the county and the uh, developer around what kinds of benefits the community is going to get from this development, specifically from the TAD money that's used. Uh, and maybe one other thing you'll hear us refer to is an IGA, which is an in intergovernmental agreement. And so that's the agreement between athens Clark County or the Mayor and Commission and uh, CCSD uh, or the school board. And uh, CCSD is the Clark County School District. Did I get all the ones you yeah, want? I, I, I think you did a great job, Jesse. So, so, uh, so what, what, you, know, you, you may be surprised to see uh, members of the Board of Education here tonight to talk about the redevelopment of a particular part of town. And so, uh, Ms. Linda, uh, Dr. Anderson, I'd like to hear more about what your roles are in this redevelopment plan. So, the thing that makes this particular tag work, that, mean, that means it has enough money for funding, was for the school district to kick in our share of the Avalorum taxes above the baseline that we set for uh, 2021. So any increment above what we received in 2021 as a school district is now going to be allocated for the tax allocation district, and that is to fund this TAD. That is the first time we've ever done anything like this, and it's certainly the only TAD that the school board participated in. So 60% of all of your ad valorem taxes go into the school district. And so again, anything above what we received in 2021 will be going to the TAD to fund the uh, development of the site. And that's our role. And we did that because we felt like, well, I'll be honest, we, we felt like there were six TADs and we hadn't participated in any, and so one of our board members thought it would be a good idea for us to, again, join the county in doing something really beneficial for the community as well. And so that, that motion passed, and then when this opportunity came up, when we finally had someone to put in a project to apply for the TAD funding, this seemed like a really great idea to me, certainly, and to other people on the district. And I'll, let, uh, I'll ask Dr. Mumby to share more. Dr. Mundy is fine. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I was not on the board of education when the tags got when this tag got approved. There were five others that were on the um, voting uh, plate, if you will, and none of those other ones got approved. And I think part of the benefit to this one at that time that was uh, identified was that that mall area is in blight. 
and it was it is largely um, commercial and so for that specific property the way that our uh, CFO sort of detailed it to the board was that if they rebuild it as residential property then it won't have as much money coming out to support students and so I think that that was part of the measure that, or, or part of, I think, the explanation that led the board to approve this particular tag. Well, now we know that that's not the case. Now we know that a large portion of this tag is going to go towards residential properties. But as a part of the community benefits agreement, I think the, the Clark County School District and the Board of Education came back and said, well, what additional incentives can we provide to this particular district um, and to people living around that area that would make this beneficial to this, the Clark County School District? And so after multiple meetings and, and a lot of back and forth, email, telephones, et cetera, um, the incentives provided to the school district to redevelop this property with that residential portion, um, it outweighed the fact that that property is going to continue to sit in blight, and it's gonna to continue to depreciate in value, and it's going to continue to remove tax dollars from our community over the next one to 20, 30 years. And so adding that residential portion where we are going to increase the student size potentially if, if you know families do move into those households is balanced by some of the things that are in the community benefits agreement that could outweigh the fact that we are going to be educating more students because of some of things that over the next 20 or 30 years will actually add a tax benefit to our community and to our district specifically, to District 6. Because the reality is that that particular parcel of land is losing value. It's losing value every year. And so if we don't do something about it, the tax benefit that comes back to CCSD is negated and then plus every single year after that. So if you multiply that by 20 years, we're talking about a negative appreciation in value that comes back to the Clark County School District. All right, thank you guys. Uh, so Scott, this, this is a question for you. Can you tell us a little more about the current site and its condition and more about the proposed site and redevelopment. Sure. Uh, so, if you've been to the mall lately, you can see it's it, it's in decline, right? And this isn't a, a, a local problem alone. We see this all over the nation. A lot of communities have suffering malls. Um, you know, I think the best explanation for that is probably the convenience of the internet. A lot of us like to shop online. Um, I'm guilty myself. It's easy to sit in my living room and either it's Amazon or whatever is your fancy, right? But what that's done is it's made brick and mortar retail much, much harder to maintain. And the mall's a really good example of that. I was there this weekend looking for shoes for my son and it was just, it's staggering that, uh, that there's so little remaining in there. Um, now part of that is because the mall is starting to position itself for a transition. But even six months ago, before this was gonna be reality, there was no denying the mall was losing ground. Um, and even further back, right, we've looked for years and seen this happening. Um, the mall property itself is about 75 acres, uh, largely impervious. Most of it is covered by asphalt or rooftop. Um, there is no stormwater management to speak of currently on that site. At one point there was, the dam broke, I don't know when, years ago. So really all of the water that hits that site primarily just runs right off into the river. Uh, this has caused some pretty decent flooding conditions and some erosion problems downstream. Uh, the county did a study, I think, um, several years ago. Arcadis did the study, and it was on the, the North Oconee. And one of the, the conclusions to that study was one of the ways they could improve water quality in the river was to put a stormwater facility on this site. Um, you know what happens? Cars park, cars leave a little bit of oil, rains, that washes into the, into the watershed. Um, over time, that has impacts. And just in, in addition to the pure volume of water that comes off of that site. So, one of the great benefits of this is the, the 
tidying up that problem, being able to not only uh, provide stormwater management, but also reduce uh, impervious cover in general. I think our plan has something like 20 acres of land that will be returned to open ground, or at least ground that can absorb rainwater um, uh, post-development. That's, that's a pretty considerable amount. Uh, in addition to that, adding trees. If you've seen, you know, you drive by the mall, there's not too much to speak of trees out there. The ones that are out there in the parking lots, they're pretty, they're, yeah, they're not going to make it very much longer, right? And there's some stuff on the edges, some pines and some things like that are in decent shape, and there's some magnolias here and there. But uh, for the most part, the parking lot trees themselves are, are, are pretty much uh, at a lost cause. Um, so tree canopy is another thing that we can do to, that, that'll be improved by the site. Part of the tree management requirements for the county, we have to provide 40% of the canopy cover for, uh, for a site like this, for a commercial general zone site. Um, and we'll make that back with this new plan. Uh, that needs about 1,000 new trees being planted, either in parking lots or on edges or along street corridors. So that's also a major improvement. You know, heat island effects are a real deal. Um, and one of the ways you try to counteract that is not only by decreasing uh, blacktop surfaces, but also shading the others that you have to, that are you know, necessary for cars. And so uh, the two-part strategy of providing stormwater and reducing impervious and then also providing shade hopefully will make a major difference to the site in general, just keep watching the speed from a stormwater and heat island effect. Um, in terms of the mall itself, the mall was built in around, I guess, the early 80s. Um, it's my understanding, I was not here in the early 80s, but it's my understanding that the mall, when it was built, really was sort of the, um, the genesis of Planet Highway really exploding, right? It, it pulled a lot of development out of downtown. J.C. Penney's left downtown and went out, uh, out west. And then the, the corridor just really expanded. And I think we're seeing the exact opposite now with the mall in decline. We've sort of seen a decline in Atlanta Highway as well. It's very interesting to see how closely those two things are tied together and the effects both positively, well, in terms of growth in the early 80s and throughout the 90s and now in this decline phase for the mall. So we see this project, you know, not only we talk about the halo effect of the project, with the improvement of this site, we don't expect to just uplift the site itself, but hopefully provide a catalyst to uplift the entire corridor. Um, you know, and, and the business that we're in, in development, I've already seen people calling, you know, like, hey, what about this site that's not on the mall site that are asking about, they're looking for out parcels that are kind of interested. You know, as soon as everybody saw that it was greenlit and got approval, all of a sudden, all those other properties too started looking really promising. And so I think in terms of improvement overall, the mall's gonna be catalyst for that. In terms of the plan itself, we're planning on taking, gosh, at least three quarters of the mall down. If you imagine where the food court is, come in the main entrance, kind of cutting through there and taking everything that's to the right of that out. Um, and then eventually where Sears is, Sears would go as well. Okay, and so that leaves Belt. Belt has a long-term lease with the mall. They have provisions that allow them to stay um, for an unbreakable lease, more or less. Uh, they had a lot of say in the plan. They got to say whether they liked it or not, whether they had view sheds still for Atlanta Highway, and so on and so forth. We had to please them first. Um, they'll get a facelift. And then everything behind them stays as well. So imagine the belt and kind of the block of uh, structure behind it would stay. Where the food court is, and to the right, um, that comes down. You can see on the plan there's a large greenway kind of border, or a center green, if you will. That would be an open park space. Okay, so one of the things about <clears throat> fighting online retail is that you have to provide a space that people want to go to. You have to have something better than your living room that makes people engaged in your site. Um, I don't know if this happens to you all much, but I know I, on the weekends or whatever, what do you want to do? What do you, what do, you want to do this weekend? What? Finding these types of spaces where you can go, let's just go to this space, there'll be something to do there. Right, whether it's just hang out in the park or whatnot, and then people tend to do a little shopping, and maybe they have dinner or lunch or something like that. So it's making shopping and retail sort of a secondary activity to the primary function of just go to that space because the space itself is activated and cool. That is the heart of what we're going for with this plan. So large center green space flanked with uh, commercial on the ground floor and, re and excuse me, residential above it. Uh, and you'll see on the plan there is quite a bit of uh, new multi-family residential, but also single-family residential too. You can see the townhomes in the back. The idea of this plan was to make sort of a gradation from intensity in the core out to lesser, more, less intense uses as a transition to the neighborhood surrounding. 
as it's surrounded by a single family, primarily on the back side. Um, you notice on Huntington Road, we're trying to engage that with single family homes, so you get the nice transition of uh, traditional you know, ranch house single family on Huntington, and then as it comes over, you have single family <coughs> townhomes, and then it transitions to a little multifamily before it hits the center commercial core. This idea of trying to make more of a gradation of uses instead of them all just being bang, commercial and rounded parking, and then you know it's very insular in those that sense. So trying to create more um, uh, weaving of the, the fabric of the neighborhood. So I think that, did I cover you, you did great there? Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. So Jesse, this is going to be a question for you. Um, so can you tell us more about? the process uh, that brought us here. So more about the plan development, more about the mark, more about the tag. Sure, I'll, I'll try to demystify the process. And you know, in these things, I'm always most excited about the Q&A part, so I'll try to do this briefly, not because I can't talk in more detail, but because I, I don't want to bother to unless you all want to hear it, so feel free to ask for more later. But um, you know, most anything that gets built in this county, anything that gets built in this county happens one of two ways. It happens by right, which is whatever someone wants to build, whether it's renovating a building, adding onto it, tearing it down, replacing it, building on a vacant lot, whatever they want to build is something that they can do according to the way our codes are written, and they don't need any special permission to make to do anything outside of that code, right? Um, or it needs some kind of waiver or changes, conditions, um, and then it goes through um, our planning commission and to the mayor and commission. So ultimately everything is decided upon by the mayor and commission. Um, our, if, it, if it requires any sort of modification outside of what's allowed by code, what can be done quote unquote by right. Um, this is a particularly large and complicated example of something that could not be done by right. Uh, but this happens all the time in much more minor ways, like you know, someone wants to uh, turn their single family house into a duplex and that can't be done by right in that neighborhood and so they have to go through the process. Um, so that's kind of your standard process that's well honed. There's dozens if not hundreds of items in a given year that go through the planning commission. Um, hundreds might be an exaggeration, certainly dozens. Many hundreds more that go through the planning department um, and are built by right. Um, when TADs get introduced into all of this, the tax allocation districts, it introduced this opportunity for areas that are particularly hard to be redeveloped to be incentivized because there is some public money that could be fed back into the project um, to, to incentivize building that might not otherwise occur or and or to get the public at the table so that what gets built looks more like what this community wants and needs, what we could describe as a, a community benefit. Um, so that use of TAD money is what opened up this whole extra can of worms of bureaucracy. And that's where you got that TAD advisory committee, the TAC that I mentioned, and then the, the MARC, the Mall Area Redevelopment Committee that I served on, both reviewing essentially the parameters of the development that would apply to that community benefits agreement, which governs the use of the TAD money. So that's different than the design of the project. Like what you see on that paper there, that's the way the whole physical infrastructure is laid out. That was all part of a decision that ran through the planning commission uh, after planning staff reviewed it, right? Um, but all along, uh, everyone was talking about how the two kind of had to happen in tandem for it to happen at all. Um, so the planning commission certainly had in mind that a lot of what they were seeing on here wasn't actually going to happen if there wasn't a community benefits agreement, but their charge was just to look at the design, not to look at the community benefits agreement. And those other two groups, the, the TAT Advisory Committee, the TAC, and the Mall Area Development Committee, the MARC, um, had to kind of look at whether that community benefits agreement was ultimately a good deal. And by a good deal, I mean, is this a well-crafted enough agreement that we know it's legally going to hold up and be binding, even if the people involved change, even if we end up in some kind of dispute later. But also, ultimately, is the amount of money that's coming back off the tax rolls to go back in these projects um, justifiable, because what we're getting from this project is a good enough benefit for the community. So those, so it's kind of a mix of that sort of due diligence, legal scrutiny, and that kind of judgment call um, that was done by the TAC and the MARC, and then all of that, all at once, came to the mayor and commission in two separate agenda items. We had our, our, our vote, it's actually three separate agenda items technically, 
So we had a vote on what came through the, the Planning Commission, which was a change in future land use and a rezone. Those are two of your votes. And then, a, and then a third vote on that community benefits agreement. Um, I think maybe the other thing I'll just add to this, unless you were expecting more from me, Buck, is um, this all started quite a while ago. Uh, I mean, you could argue this started many, many years ago. You pick your pick your beginning point. But really, where the people involved in owning and redeveloping the site <coughs> started to approach officials that work for the government was about two years ago. Um, and, and ultimately, two Decembers ago is when they brought their first draft of a plan through the planning department, and then it was heard in February of um, 2022 by the planning commission, and it was not heard particularly favorably. Um, I also hosted a town hall, and people at the town hall didn't feel very good about it. There's a lot of people feeling not very good about it. Uh, and so the, the people who were bringing that proposal forward um, really heard, I think, from the community and absorbed and, and made real substantial substantive meaningful changes to what they brought forward in their next version, which looked almost exactly like what you see there. Um, and that was where they actually got rid of their engineering firm and they brought on WNA Engineering to, to, to do that work. Um, so when we talk about a community benefits agreement, I think of it as kind of in two phases, in that there's a bunch of stuff that is community benefit baked into what was their PD, their proposal for the Planning Commission to consider. That included like the design for not only the transit station, but also all the bus stops in it, all the connectivity to adjacent neighborhoods, all that stormwater infrastructure and grading that Scott was alluding to, all the green space, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll, I'll avoid enumerating everything you already spoke to. That was baked into what was kind of like round one of community benefit. And then round two of community benefit was like, okay, now we're talking about this TAD money. And some of us feel like you get to do more than just that. And that's where you got things like the affordable housing component, and the child care center, and the internship program, and the minority and women-owned business program, and probably some other thing, the youth development center, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I think a lot of people started to really hear about this. There was a lot more media reporting. There were certainly a lot more meetings of all these layers of bureaucracy um, in the few months leading up to that mayor and commission vote. And that might have given the impression that like a lot was being decided just in a couple of months. Um, but actually, a lot was finally really being discussed and hammered out with people really digging their heels in and kind of really negotiating harder in those last couple months, something that had been going on for about a year and a half to two years. Awesome. Thank you, Jesse. So, uh, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Linda, um, can you tell us more about the tax allocated districts uh, and how it relates to the mall redevelopment project? So when the Clark County School District um, voted to approve District 6 being involved in this tax allocation district, the, the intergovernmental agreement basically said, all right, we will freeze the taxes that are coming out of District 6 starting January 1st, 2021. And any incremental increase in that tax by the parcel, by the way, by the parcel, will be thrown into basically like a bank account, like an escrow. If you've ever bought a house, you put your money in an escrow and you wait for all the contracts to work out. And so that's, that's essentially what's happening right now. So from 2021 to today, there's money being placed into this escrow account, if you will, to redevelop these properties based on community agreement, CCSD, ACC, et cetera. And so what this means is that if we don't do any development, then that money just sits in that pot. So any incremental increase that we have, and right now it's very little because there is no redevelopment happening, right? So any incremental increase that we have is sitting in a bank account waiting to be spent and no one is spending it because that vote already happened. And so right now the decision is, do we approve these redevelopments and hope that that incremental tax increase 
amount to what this development will be, or do we just not do anything and let this bank account continue to increase in what's inside of it? We can't reverse the vote that already happened. The only thing that we can do is invest in something better than what we have today and hope that the tax value of that parcel, that one parcel, not all of District 6, but that one parcel, every improvement that they make from today moving forward will increase the tax value of that property. And once that tax value increases, it goes back into that bank account and they can borrow against it. And so what we're looking at here is something that we've already agreed that we're gonna do as a community, right? We've already said, let's open this bank account and let's put money in it. And now we're trying to agree on how we're gonna spend it. And so what this mark did and what ACC did was say, if you're gonna pull money from this bank account, what's in it for us? What's in it for ACC? What's in it for CCSD? What's in it for the Clark County School District? And what's in it for, for, the, for, the, for the county? And the intergovernmental agreement and the community benefits agreement that we approved at the end of months and months of conversations and discussions said, okay, if you do these things, then after you have already invested money from your private funding, you can start pulling from our bank account. They are essentially financing millions, I think it's 70, millions of dollars before they can pull from a bank account that we have already approved from 2021 that money is gonna go into. And they cannot pull from that bank account until they have fulfilled the promises that are in the community benefits agreement. And the last thing that I'll add to this is that we asked, the mark asked for the Clark County government to give us an inventory of all of the other tags in the state and what they're doing for their community benefits agreement to get money into private industry to build in their communities, and it doesn't even begin to match what we asked for. It doesn't even begin to touch what we asked for. And the reason, I've got two. One, we are a diverse community, and we are a loud community. We sit at a table and we ask for what we need and we don't say yes until we get it. That's how Athens is. I grew up in this community, that's how we are. And so when we sit and talk about what comes back to our community in this investment, I know that a lot of people don't agree with it and you probably still won't after this conversation and this panel and it's fine. But at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is looking at a parcel of land and something that we already decided that we were gonna do in 2021, and now we're agreeing to doing that. And this is transformational, possibly. So I'm a little bit older, <laughs> and uh, I have the joy and privilege, I think, of living in Atlanta when the tag for uh, 1417 Street was approved. I didn't know it was a tad at the time, but I lived through that transformation of that abandoned space that was mostly railroad tracks and practically nothing else. I got to experience going into the 17th Street development there and looking at that transformation. And when I heard that it was funded with a tad, then I do understand how as long as, and I didn't live in Atlanta for a lot of years, but long, as long as I did live there, my church was really close to that area, it was an eyesore. It was nothing, absolutely nothing was happening there. So when this TAD was approved by the board, and I'll confess, I am the one vote that said no. 
I don't want to approve a tag when we don't know what we're going to do. But this is how it was presented to us, just as it was presented to the commission. Let's go ahead and approve these tag districts, and then we will find someone or assign the allocations to someone who brings us a good plan. And so we bought a pig and a poke, and that's an oh, and that's what I called it back then. It's a pig and a poke. They said, okay, do it, and then they will come. And so when I saw this plan and met the people that were doing this plan and had conversations with them, I got really excited because I knew the possibilities of what could happen. And I'll also just you know, remind you that the, that whole 14th Street Atlantic Station thing has gone through a couple of iterations since it started. But nothing went back to ruin. It is every time coming back better and stronger. And so I have hope and I am optimistic that this is going to be transformative and it, as it is on paper. I am convinced that the people that are doing this are looking for that transformation as well. Now, I think it'll be up to us to make sure that that happens. But again, as, as Dr. Anderson has said, none of this is left up to chance. They have a, what is it, the PD, right, that specifies exactly what must be done to bring this plan to fruition, followed by the IGA, which again takes the school board out of the work of trying to manage a development because that is not what we do, we educate children. And so that work falls to the county to make sure that the letter of the law is followed on this and that everything that was promised will be delivered. And so I feel good about that decision as well. And I will also say that in talking to the developers, I kept hearing them say, we want to build a live, work, play community. With all of the new tech jobs that are coming into Athens, with all of the new growth that's happening around Athens, we want to have a place where people can live, work, and play. And so I'm like, that's exactly what's happening at Atlantic Station. I have friends who actually still live there, been there for like 20 years now. And they still love that community that evolved from that, and they live in some of the townhouses really close to where the IKEA place was over there. So I feel confident that should it come to fruition, I mean, I have no expectation that it will not, since this company didn't come to us and say, we're going to go out and put bonds out to raise money to do this work. They are funding this up front. They will be reimbursed with the monies that are in the tag. Only if the things that they are asking for reimbursement for are already spelled out in the CBA and in the, uh, in the uh, what is it, the, in the PD as well. So I feel good that even when you started out with the field of dreams, there are enough people that are suspicious enough and not trustful enough that we put some really strong safeguards in here to protect the investment coming from our community. I don't know that there is an exit strategy. I don't think anybody's trying to exit. I think we want to see this happen and we want to see it be very successful. And that is about all I have to say about that. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to uh, give uh, the floor an opportunity to, to, to ask questions. Uh, before I do that, um, the, the, the Scott or Jesse, do you guys have anything else to add? Uh, I'll just go ahead and address where this project is right now, right? Because we just finished going through this major entitlement process and agreement of the community benefits agreement, so it's like, what's next? Um, I'm sure that's been on, that's a question that's coming then. So I'll just go ahead and hit that one. Um, so the mall was closed Friday. Uh, all the property was, uh, the balance of the property was, was, uh, was closed by the developers. Um, you know, prior to this, they only owned a little bit of the property. So um, it was owned by an Israeli group. So that made negotiations difficult and it made extensions very difficult. It's part of the, constantly we're running into deadline issues. You know, it was, they were not willing to give too many more extensions. By that I mean zero more, zero extensions. After um, the two, after the two, yeah. So that's great. That's our. That's a, a huge milestone to, to pass. Um, we've already begun biweekly calls, uh, working on design drawings. We expect to probably be in that phase for the next five to six months. Uh, and again, those those that involves not only site development, civil engineering, and landscape architecture drawings, but also architecture drawings for these large buildings. In addition to utility relocations, there's a ton of utilities 
all of this has to happen while the mall stays in business, right? So Belk has to remain functioning through all of this, which makes phasing very difficult. Um, we can expect permitting probably takes 90 days after that. That puts us somewhere starting construction in, uh, say, early 2024, and construction's probably two years or so or more. Um, but given the immensity of this project, it's a pretty aggressive and pretty fast timeline. One of the reasons that um, we're seeing such fast movement, um, Dr. Anderson talked a little bit about this with Tad, the project has to generate the increment. Okay, so it has to in increase in value in order for there to be money available to pay back, to pay into the increment for the Tad, which means the developer, the, the ask for the Tad was $189 million in 30, over 30 years. So whether they, when they reach 189 million in year 27, that's the end of the tab, and then the full increment flows back to the coffers, or if they reach uh, 30 years, regardless of how much money's been increased, the tab that ends. So they have to, doing the math, they have to get underway and improve the value of the property as quickly as possible so that the increment starts generating and accumulating if they're gonna have a chance to get back the money that they need to pay that, that uh, part of performer. This really places a lot of the performance, if not all of the performance, on the developer to not only produce a project quickly, but also produce something that is really good. Because unless the project is successful, there's no increment, and so it doesn't pay. It's a great vehicle. It allows for almost zero risk for the city and the county. Unified government and places a lot of it on, on all on the developer. So it's been a, a very interesting process to get to know intimately, um, and we are now seeing result of that, which is we're moving fast. Real quick, we, you used the word, yeah, I think the phrase, the mall closed on Friday. You sure. didn't mean that it closed the doors. Yeah, sorry, so if you've ever bought a house, bear by a piece of something, you know, when you close the deal, right? Yeah, sorry, we, we thank you, buddy. <laughs> the property changed hands. The mall, the mall remains open. Bell, Bell made sure of that. Uh, <laughs> All right. I wrote down five things I'll blow through real quick here, and then we'll open up for Q&A. So, so one is I, I want us to think about how when we're talking about the transformative impact of a project of this size, this is an area the size of downtown. I know these Federation of Neighborhood meetings often have a more in-town, downtown crowd. We're talking about a collection of parcels just outside the loop, the size of downtown. So, I mean, you can drag and drop on Google Maps if you don't believe me, but it, it is massive. Um, which also means there's a lot of weight behind this decision, uh, but certainly there's a lot of potential. What can, what can come from this for the entirety of West Athens, super especially the Atlanta Highway Corridor, and really the, the county as a whole. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention was that the model of this community benefits agreement is a pay-go model, which is different from what's typical for TADs. So TADs usually do a bonding model where the, the county or municipality is like the fiscal agent to sign on to a bond. That puts both more risk on the government um, and also means that that money's coming up front. What that usually means is that you have a more fleshed out plan that's like more guaranteed to happen, as much as we can guarantee anything these days. Um, so a lot of the uncertainty that we're seeing with like, okay, like where is the financing going? Do we think this is gonna happen? Um, some of that is just inherent in the style of deal of a pay-go model. Um, but all the, all the, almost all the risk really is on the private developer. So we, you know, you heard their attorneys refer to it as like de-risking it for the, the government, but I think in a lot of ways that's, that's, that's quite true. Um, they only get access to this money, as Linda pointed out, if they really build everything that they said they would, and only after it's built. Um, so, so we're not paying into this unless we get exactly what they said they would give us. Um, the next thing I, I wanted to point out, um, and this is kind of building off what Dr. Anderson is speaking to, and thank you very much for, for kind of breaking down like how this account works. Um, they're only eligible for monies specifically generated by the parcels the mall is on. So the TAD is like a map drawn across like a couple hundred parcels. Some of them are even single family homes and things and a bunch of public streets. Um, but only the increased value of the actual mall properties is what's going to pay back into this. So they're basically just getting like a, like a tax break in a particularly complicated structure for their own property. Uh, all that other money 
that's generated by adjacent parcels into the TAD, into the account that Dr. Anderson likened to an escrow account, is still available for something else and cannot be used for this. This is specifically structured so that only if and when, hopefully when, <laughs> these folks uh, you know, build the thing and make it more valuable uh, and then that money is generated, are they then eligible to get it back from that specifically? Someone builds something somewhere else, if property values go up or down elsewhere, has no bearing on what happens here. Um, fourth of five, uh, I saw in the canned questions, we didn't get to quite all of them, but there's a question of timing and I get asked this a lot. In the extremely large tome that is our community benefits agreement, you may want to look for phase table. You can just like search the document for phase table. It's schedule 6-1. But in the many schedules, which kind of, kind of refers to like all the things that need to happen and when and how, you'll see a breakdown of what exactly will be built when, and it refers to the parcels that are referenced on the PD. Um, but the, the short version is, th this is structured as deadlines, so ideally, as Scott spoke to, you know, they might build even quicker, and then it's generating value even sooner, um, but the only way they get money at all is if they build it by these deadlines. So the earliest we can expect completion to be done on portions is 2027, and the latest we can expect the last stuff to be built is 2031, just to give you all a feel. And the last thing I wanted to refer to, I could go on and on about all the really cool stuff as one of the skeptical, cynical people that served on the mark with Linda. Uh, you know, like to really try to make sure that we didn't just have nice sounding language, but language that would really hold up in court if well-paid lawyers started to go to battle with each other, right? Um, and, and so we have in here a maintenance plan. Um, and, and why I think that's especially cool is a lot of times what gets built, including what gets built with public money or with a tax break, just focuses on what goes in the ground at the outset and doesn't necessarily contemplate what happens a decade or three decades out. Well, we got a little more leverage here because we're talking about a three decade deal, right? Um, and so we really looked at, well, the pavement that goes in the ground once you put it down, ain't gonna be in any kind of condition 30 years from now. So how do we make sure that you, as the private developer, who may well sell, and then that person sells again, uh, actually still has a road 10, 20, 30 years from now that people can actually drive down, still has a sidewalk that people can actually walk across, still has a stormwater pipe that doesn't collapse and create a sinkhole. Well, we're gonna have a, a, a maintenance plan built into this agreement um, that all parties have to agree to before you, you get access to any of this money too. So that maintenance plan is actually still in the works right now. Um, should be executed sometime within the next, what, like two months roughly? Is that what we're looking has at? To has, to be done, has to be done by August, but they're trying to make stuff happen as soon as possible, right? So August at the latest. So there is, I think, an, an even above average um, for Clark County and really for agreements like this in general um, stipulation that what we see happen on this site doesn't go the way of a lot of other private developments. Uh, I, you know, I feel like I learned from the mistakes of, you know, commissions of your, not, not nothing against them, just like, you know, we approve private developments, they build private roads, they put in street lights, they put in sidewalks, they deteriorate, the people who built it sell or, or leave, and a bunch of homeowners move in, not aware that they're now like personally responsible for 1 20th of a road that's gonna cost them you know, five or six figures to replace, right? And so to safeguard against that phenomenon happening here, we have this, this built into it, and I, I feel particularly excited about that. Yeah. Final. Thank you, guys. Uh, so we'd like to take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, yes, ma'am. So back to the TED, real quick. So there, the developer will the, the money that is available to the developer through that, it, there's a cap on it, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So they have, they say they are going to be able to develop this within $70 million and that's what you guys will give back to them, or they'll be able to access, right? So is there, and, that, and that's only for like what you were explaining, the actual footprint of the existing wall itself, yes. not the outlying properties around anything outside of that. It's very interesting. Yeah, and that's oh, yeah, and that's 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 how tabs are, are are built. Is the parcel itself has to increase in value as they're developing it, and and so yeah, the the surrounding part. There's this halo effect that they've talked about, 
um, where increases in land value and property value and all of those will happen around, but that's not part of the reimbursement process for the money that is in this account for them to uh, pull from. And an additional um, statement that I'll make is that there is a, an, a, a, a person, I don't know, account, accountant, uh, Verification agent, thank you. There's a verification agent that, that is going to be responsible for ensuring that every receipt that they submit for reimbursement accounts for what is in the CBA, what is in the IGA. Like all of the things that we agreed on, they are only reimbursed for those things. So we talked about a lot in our committee, um, soft money, right? And and there's all of these things that are non-reimbursable that we talked about in our committee, and we said, well, you're not gonna get money back for this. And their argument was, well, our return on investment will earn us back the money that we're not gonna get for you know, personnel for this particular thing, or gifts and uh, gifts for this other thing. And so there, there is a, um, a verification agent that will determine what, what they get reimbursed for, for every single item that happens during this redevelopment process. And they can only get reimbursed if the parcel increases in value and that money of the parcel that has increased in value goes into this account. So they not only have to come up with the money up front, they have to come up with the rest of the money to develop the rest of it outside of it. The reason I'm concerned is because I live in Holiday Estates, right next door. Mm -hmm. So that means we're facing nine years of construction mm -hmm. along the Huntington Road corridor and everything that goes along with it and the destruction of those roads and when are those going to get repaved and, you know, getting in and out of our neighborhood because that is the only way to get to our neighborhood. Well, I take that back. We can go around, but the only ways to go through the mall. And so it's... It's very concerning to us, but we're going to have to trust that the decisions that have been made are going to be in the best interest for that entire area. So I would like to add that one of the things I think that might give you some um, relief is that, like I said, Belt has to remain open, Mall has to remain open. Right. So the site doesn't close. Parts of the site close if it's phased, um, which means there's always going to be a way to navigate through and at times for brief periods say like when they're installing the roundabout in Huntington there will be a reroute um, but it will be a fairly short detour and the dates that Jesse gave are outside like drop dead type dates if, if construction is not completed by those dates then they risk uh, a default on the deal so like I said it's in their best interest to get that construction done quickly um, no one wants to have construction for nine years. No, they want to do yeah, it for like two. It's been 2029, didn't you? Know? Right. That, that, <laughs> so that's part of the CBS, 30, but they can't linger. What they say. <laughs> but that wouldn't benefit the developer because if they're still in construction in 10 years from now, it means they're going to lose all that chance for that increasing increment. Mm -hmm. And so the longer they stay under construction and do not open, that's just money they're losing that they cannot be regained as part of the, um, part of the package. So. They're going to want to button it up as fast as possible for a number of reasons. And I just wanted to make sure that we're differentiating that the mall itself, of course, is the project that is under this CBA and under this IGA, and the, um, it is a portion of the TAD. So those other properties that qualify for the TAD are waiting for someone to bring forward an application for those funds as well. And so it's not just this one space, it's the largest space by anybody's uh, guess, but then there, there, the other surrounding parts of the TAD that are included in here. <clears throat> Again, this developer doesn't have access to those funds, but if someone else brings forward a plan to redo another property, then it falls under a similar kind of arrangement. So that, again, you're going to have multiple people working on, in this area, I would think, to go after these same funds. So. I may just add a couple things. You know, 
the blessing and the curse of Belk, right? So right. the curse of Belk, uh, to my chagrin, is that we have a lot more surface parking where I wish there was something else, like green space or housing or structured parking instead. Um, but the blessing of Belk is that because they have to stay open all the time, all the folks who live adjacent who rely upon kind of using that mall to get through it, and I'm well aware of many folks in your situation. You know, it's a nightmare on Atlanta Highway traffic-wise, right? And you, you know your way of navigating that nightmare. So your formula might have to change, but your ability to somehow traverse that tract is going to remain because Belk basically negotiated that people are going to have to do exactly what you're hoping to be able to do. Um, yeah, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, thank them, but also wag your finger at them for some of the other stuff they made us do. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to point to, I, I love that you asked about this idea of like, what's the most we can spend? Um, so much of the conversation for a lot of the negotiation was just like, is this feasible, right? And so like, how, how can we feel confident that you're actually gonna generate something worth the amount that can pay for this to make this whole thing viable? Uh, but near the end, we really started to get into, but what if you really knock this out of the park? Like, we don't want to just subsidize the profits of private developers, right? Um, and so if you, anyone who hasn't already watched the many meetings of the mark, you could. Um, you could hear the attorney that we hired, Dan McRae, who's very experienced in this outside attorney, talk about how he built a very wide moat. And this is a guy who's like, his reputation for getting work like this relies upon these deals being good, right? Um, and, and, and that wide moat included two caps. So there's a cap on the overall amount of money that can go into the project from the TAD, and a cap on the percent of the overall value of the property that can be generated back in. So if these guys and their many, many other workers uh, get us something built, ideally before those deadlines, which were 2027 to 2031, um, then, uh, and, and they do it so well and so quickly that it's worth way more, we're not on the hook for more than those caps. And it's whichever of those is lower, right? So we're not, we're not paying 29% of something that's worth twice what anyone expected. Oh, and I know construction costs over time, doesn't matter how much time, whatever amount of time there is between the time you make the decision to build it to the time you actually build it, it goes up. Absolutely, and I think that's a lot of where you saw in the, in the deal, some of that, like the soft cost that was being spoken to, is like everyone's trying to guess at what things are going to cost over the next decade and doing their best job of having the best people make their best estimate. Um, but at the end of the day, it is still some amount of educated guesswork, right? Um, and so our safeguard is this is the maximum that we're willing to pay. Thank you. Also, should bring in the, the, uh, the other really good thing about this development is these people are local. So they're going to be your neighbors, and they're people that you know and you'll have access to. So I think that goes a long way, at least in my opinion, in terms of uh, accountability and credibility. So I, I feel real excited about that being, being done locally. I, I can give everyone Scott's cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question. You guys uh, have touched on the court, and uh, I think that we, I, I agree with her. I think infrastructure is probably most of everybody's concern here. Traffic is really bad. I would like to hope that, uh, th I guess this is for you, Jesse, that they are looking at the on, on and off ramps. They're looking at the overall corridor, how that's going to impact, you know, the area. You know, I, I agree that the mall does need to be revitalized, but I also want to hope that they're going to be doing something about the corridor mm -hmm. and traffic. Yes. Uh, the short answer is, oh yeah. Like, a lot's going to be done. But what exactly is still a little undefined? So I think as Paul was asking me before we get started, um, and, and big thanks to the folks who came to my town hall on transportation, which focused on the Atlanta Highway Corridor and here today. Uh, I'm hoping to do another one of those once we actually have a defined plan from GDOT. Um, but Atlanta Highway is a GDOT corridor, Georgia Department of Transportation. So um, the county gets some amount of influence, mostly in the form of asking, sometimes in the form of begging, occasionally in the form of leverage, like, hey, we've got T-SPLOS money. Um, but, but, you know, mostly in the form of asking strategically for GDOT to try to design or redesign things the way we'd hope uh, would best align with our plans for our community. 
And uh, a, a lot of how we are able to define that is to have master plans for the corridor, for our future land use maps, et cetera, that match what we're currently saying. And so there's a little bit of catch up to do. A, a really great example of this is work before the planning department on our future land use map update, um, which is like a very ad abstract concept, but is particularly poignant here, especially when we think about how Jennings Mill Parkway was built to handle truck traffic for industrial development that never came, and now it's just a bunch of single family neighborhoods. And, and so, for us to compel GDOT or like a federal agency to give us money to really dramatically reimagine these corridors, we need to have the, those plans in place that match what we actually want now. And what we actually want now, some in some ways matches what people were thinking all along, but in some ways is a dramatic departure. So we need to fix those dramatic departures to match what we currently need. Um, so that's where like if you hear us talking about master plannings, there really is value in that. Another thing I'd point to back to the future land use map is the, the past iteration of this, while we missed the mark on things like Jennings Mill Parkway, um, the, the growth concept areas, uh, there was a big one highlighted on the mall, and then the tag got built around the mall, and now we're seeing this happen. And you know, the idea is that you, you have a big enough, substantial enough change in one place, and it drives change to happen all along the rest of the corridor. And so I think the hope is that this development is going to catalyze a lot of those more dramatic changes. And it happens to dovetail very well with the timing of GDOT's project, which is entirely in their purview, but Lord knows we're really trying to get them to do it in a way that you know, we're hoping will really align with our bicycle and pedestrian master plans, so that whatever bridge gets built can be, can be crossed over by people who aren't in, a, in, a, in, a, in their own personal vehicle. It's also hopefully going to align with our transit development master plan, which is also being reworked now to include this expansion station in this development now that we know it can happen here, and also align with our T-SPLOST project list, which includes specifically money for Atlanta Highway Corridor, and also align with our Athens in Motion master plan, which identifies Atlanta Highway Corridor as one particularly in need, especially now that we've brought on a couple of new people in our Transportation Public Works Department Another acronym would be TBW here. Uh, a lot of good folks at TBW, but we got two new ones, a bicycle pedestrian coordinator and a vision zero coordinator whose mission is to reduce our traffic fatalities to zero. And they've created, using data we already had, but just hadn't put together in this way, a crash map. And it shows you where people are dying. And they also have data that shows that last year more people died in Athens, pedestrians and bicyclists, than any time in the last 15 years. Um, so we have a, a dire need to like literally change the way our infrastructure is working so people can live through like getting to the grocery store. Um, and one of the hot spots is Atlanta Highway around the mall. So all of these master plans dovetail and I, I really think that this project is gonna catalyze us having the funding and the attention to really take those plans off the shelf and really like put the stuff in the ground to realize them. I hope that's... Uh, it, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be many more of these meetings, but we're working on it. I guess the whole thing is like, you know, just the fact that everybody's thinking about it. That's the main thing. Yeah. Definitely thinking about it. And the last thing I'll add is uh, I welcome your grievances and complaints wholeheartedly, uh, especially if they're in writing and especially if other people are copied. Uh, it makes it real easy for me to be like, it's not just me as one of 10 commissioners competing with nine other commissioners for the stuff in their district, it's all these people with their stories that match the data on that crash map. Um, so please keep, keep coming, keep bringing it up. Yeah. All right. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get to you in just a second. So this is... So this is actually where I disagree with Commissioner Hall because I live in that district and I, I, I drive my kid to Timothy Road Elementary School every morning and I take the bypass and I think it's going to be quicker and then I get off the bypass and there's four lights and they're not synchronized and so there's just a backup of traffic for four lights this is where I disagree with him, and this is where I had the hardest time, probably. Um, maybe a couple of other things, but the hardest time, I think, with um, approving this deal. Because some people sent me an email and said, 
Christmas every day, I think was the sort of tagline where when you do this, it's gonna be Christmas every day and everyone's gonna like flood to that area and it's gonna create more traffic pandemonium than we already have in the that Atlanta Highway uh, corridor. And I think the reason why I sort of took a second thought was because there, in that plan, there are traffic circles that are approved and they're a little bit further down from where the major traffic fat, uh, fatalities happen. They're maybe, I don't know, like a half a mile or so from where the major uh, traffic fatalities happen. So if we can create a more traffic diet friendly zone in that area with that transit station, we may be able to see some improvement despite the fact that residential properties are gonna be there, we may be able to see some improvements and that has happened in other cities where you increase residential communities but you add road diets, you add traffic infrastructure that creates a balance between what's happening on the road and what's happening in the community. And that entire parcel is the size of downtown Athens. And so there's an, there's an opportunity for us to create a balance of what's happening on the road to what's happening inside of homes and in cars that we can possibly see some improvement despite the fact that there may be 200 um, homes that are added to that park, to that area because it is such a huge parcel. And the other thing that I'll add is there is a trail that's about two miles, maybe a little bit less, and there are living, sp or there are spaces for people to commune that is different than what we see right now. And so what we're talking about over time, and this is me talking from a public health lens because I'm a public health practitioner, is you see a difference in behavior, right? And so you're not seeing people who jump in their cars and just flee, and there's like this traffic congestion that happens. What you're seeing is people who go there and they spend time and so the traffic congestion is spread out through time, and that is a difference from the nine to five intense traffic that we're seeing right now. And so I would argue that we need to refocus our vision on whether or not this property is going to increase traffic, and rather, whether or not the way that this property is redeveloped will create a sense of more flow in that corridor. Because currently that corridor is really only for commuters who are going through into Oconee, right? And so it, it really just takes a reimagining and that's, that's kind of what I had to do. But I still struggle. I'm not gonna lie, and I, I will put it on public record right now. I still struggle with whether or not that's going to increase the congestion in that area, the fatalities in that area, and how we feel when we wake up in the morning and we're like, oh my God, I gotta drive through Atlanta Highway, I gotta drive through Timothy Road, I gotta drive through, come, like, mm. Let's, let's maybe take a step back and think about whether or not we can reimagine the flow of traffic in that area, and I think this may help. This may help, because what we have currently is not working. Thank you. Uh, you had a question? Yes, yes sir. I did. My uh, first question was answered. Technically, there's so many lawsuits on the west side, which I believe the road was in Deerfield. I know there were a lot of outside there decades ago had not had the mall access road in Maryland. Way. So the curse and blessing of the dog is nice. So my second question is more in tune with the financing of the project itself. As this is drug on, the financial markets have changed dramatically, the interest rate environment has changed dramatically. And my concern some of my other neighbors' concerns have been what is a feasible project with one interest rate environment and what one that is not. And I understand yields and commitments are made when entitlement happens, things happen. Also, I'm going to start talking about nine years. Contracts don't happen as much. I think that's probably driven to Scott. Scott, can you 
Okay, so that. I can do my best. I can't speak for the developers' finances so much, mm -hmm. but what I can say is this particular set of developers, like as David said, are local, and they do have some pretty good deep pockets in terms of financing themselves. They're, they are, they are self-financed um, to an extent, right? Like they're not going to be out of pocket for the entire price tag for all of it, but the upfront money, they're what's well within the means, and so it's really all about trying to get to that second stage where they're going out to the market and financing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a crystal ball, right? We all wish we had it. Um, I, all we know is we can't wait. And um, you know, I, as someone who makes their living in development and has lived through the recession and seen what that is, I mean, it's tough to try and hedge for those things. You just kind of have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and, and, and keep going. Um, the good news is, is we still remain busy right now, busier than we've ever been. Um, and so we are always crossing our fingers that the market remains strong without you know, inflation gets tamped down a bit without stalling the market. But I mean, it's 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 what development's all about, right? It's why it takes strong intestinal fortitude to do these types of things <laughs> because they are they they're risky. But in the same sense, I think given the group that is behind this. Um, you know, it's it's a very special type of situation for this community. You would not see outside developer coming in and, and doing what they've done. It's for local pride, a lot of it's to be uh, attempted. So um, we remain very uh, optimistic, bullish on the project, and uh, for the sake of all the entire industry and our community, we hope that uh, inflation sort of finds its finds its ends and starts to decline a bit. Thank you. I may just add very briefly, you know, one thing this project has going for it from for the developers is they're getting a lot of money from the the public deal. Um, you know, I struggled. You know, where where Dr. Anderson? I, I'm actually not sure that you said anything, Dr. Anderson. I disagree with. Although maybe it was framed a little differently, but Lord knows, Atlanta Highway is a nightmare, <laughs> uh, and I felt very, you know, torn many times along the way, kind of right up until the end. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think when I talk about feeling confident that we got a good deal, I don't think we got a perfect deal, you know, but we don't live in a perfect world. We're trying to build from the world we've got. Um, I think that the deal we got is very good for the community of Athens because it has a longer list of benefits and many of them extremely important and large that makes it worthwhile. But part of why it's also a good deal is because like, we really need something like this to happen on Atlanta Highway and specifically at the mall to like transform what's happening in that whole side of town, what's really the heart of District 6, you know? Um, if we wanna have a community in that part of athens Clark County that looks anything like what we're building elsewhere in athens Clark County. Um, and, and that ultimately means that we paid an above average amount into this. Like the amount that we're committing to, that percentage is like, when, when someone is referring to like who's gonna oversee it, that verification agent, they're looking at the redevelopment powers law. They're looking at laws on the books. Um, and any law has a certain amount of gray area, but a lot of it's pretty black and white. And that's what they're verifying in terms of the figures the financial figures, I'm like, do these dollars go to this thing? Is that thing eligible? Um, but ultimately, just because it's eligible doesn't mean that you need to be putting public money toward it, right? And a lot of these developments that happen elsewhere, especially in larger markets like Atlanta, don't have as much of an investment from the community as you're seeing into this one from Athens. And so I think um, that also likely gives them more resiliency to weather some amount of storm in the markets. Um, although if we saw some kind of major crash like we saw in 2008, I mean, who knows, you know? But at that point, you know, if, if all we're ever doing is planning for another 2008 to happen, we'll never do anything. So, um, so we just try to do the best we can, so. Yeah, undoubtedly, it's better than what we have currently. Yeah. And I'm glad to see it before. The so. tab dollars definitely yeah. help with the underwriting, right? They're, they're a, a better guarantee being that they are, you know, as long as the project go forward, they, they definitely help that underwriting on the back side. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One, one last question and then a question for the, for the group here. Are there um, um, other cities in Georgia or elsewhere where there's somewhat similar corridors to find involved or I, 
I think that probably, if you look just over in Gwinnett, uh, Gwinnett Place Mall right now is undergoing sort of a, a, a revisioning. Um, and I'm not super up to date with the details other than I know that the city um, had taken down a good bit, if not almost all of that land and basically purchased it. So it's a very different sort of situation. They're way more at risk than this community. This community has the benefit of having a private developer as local that assumes the risk. Um, so, but it's a, it's a similar situation, right? That mall declining and how do you re-envision that? And their plan has some very similar type of attributes, uh, you know, heavy on green space, trying to increase residential, trying to create a sense of sort of a, a hub of, of community there. Um, so that'll be one to, take, to keep an eye on as it's very, very close to, close to our home. I had an observation when I was talking to a colleague of mine who was discussing Wire Park in Oconee County. And one of the things that I recognized in that discussion was that when spaces near the athens Clark County Oconee border develop, it is almost exclusively residential or sorry, commercial. It's almost exclusively commercial. And that's because there's more of an incentive for those developers to make it commercial property. And so in District 6, what we tend to do, and I think Jesse can attest to this, we go across to the Oconee border, and we go to Lowe's, we go to Trader Joe's, we go to the Oconee Connector Mall area and all those things, and they are all commercial. And so this opportunity for us to take a space on our side of the border and make the taxes work for us made it so that the conversations around the table were, what can you do for us? Not Old Navy, not DSW or Broad Way Shoes or whatever it is, not Trader Joe's, not the places that were across our border that were largely commercial, but what can you do for us? Give us residential, give us trails, give us traffic circles. Give us a transit station. Give us all of those things that our athens Clark County community needs to thrive so that we don't have to go over that way in District 6 to shop and enjoy ourselves. And so the way that this translated in my brain was, oh, well, I can go a mile and do the things that I do when I go two miles across the border where Oconee County got all the tax incentives to their local, to their businesses to build on their property and we didn't get that. But we got a community benefits agreement to do the same thing that Oconee County does a mile and a half away. That's how I looked at it. It was like, when you think about that in your brain, it means a lot. Because you're traveling a mile to give your taxes to another county when you could do it right here. And you could have people living in that space with affordable housing for an entire generation, which is transformative for families. You can have childcare. You can have internships. You can have all of these things that we agreed on as a community that we would have. That was, that's what made the difference to me of voting yes to voting no, is looking across and seeing what happens in Oconee County when they have commercial properties versus what we could do here that could make a difference in our community as a tax base. Yeah, Just think about that. Well, I agree because people, that live in the county that have to pay property taxes and we continue to see 
our property taxes go up, but then we drive by the mall and we see that going down into nothing. You know, I I would be uh, not as upset about the increases in my property taxes if the county showed that they were using it in a way that I felt was appropriate. Yeah. And having a park and having the trails is great for us because we're right next door. Yeah. How many people will come and take advantage of all that is a question that remains to be seen yeah. until it gets built. So hopefully that will be the thing that will continue to where people can enjoy that particular area because definitely the West Side needs. But look at the Something parking beautiful. lots of Lowe's. Look at the parking lots of Trader Joe's. Right. Look at the parking lots of Home Depot. Look at the parking, like, it is literally a mile away. And all of those people are going a mile to shop when they could come here and spend their money in Clark County. I mean, she's lived there 50 years. I lived there, I got my house when Lowe's was down the street, when Walmart was across the street. You know, we've watched it. Did that development basically kill that construction <laughs> anyway? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't help it. It was a confluence of things, but yeah, the malls are not the thing. Oh. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Tim. I was just wondering if, if one of y'all, because we talked about the and business agreement, but one of y'all could just go kind of down the list, the list what's actually in it, the benefits that we use getting. Oh. Okay. I am the least, least, least versed in this, but I'm going to take a stab at it because he's flipping pages. Okay, so you start with the transit system. You do the green space. You do the 12-foot wide, two-mile trail throughout this property. You do the live, work, play concept where you have parking garages to get rid of, uh, taking up more of the, uh, the surface space for parking. Then you move into the community benefit agreements that we all, the Mark was a part of discussion, discussing. And that would include the uh, Boys and Girls Club space that is going to remain at an extremely reduced rental rate, and that program is expanding. There will be another space, I uh, can't remember exactly the square footage of it, that is going to be paying the same rate that the police department pays in the mall, which is about $100 a month. Uh, and that's going to be set aside for uh, small business and women, small and women-owned businesses, minority women-owned businesses. And then you will have, which I am most proud of, is I hope a strong partnership with our school system and the apprenticeship program coming through the Athens uh, Community uh, Career Academy. And I think that's it. The, also uh, an incentive for a, a reduction for well, I wouldn't call it a reduction. I, I don't know exactly the right word to use, but um, a, an affordability piece for our teachers and uh, Clark County School District employees to become home ownership, to, to participate in home ownership at the mall. 10% uh, set aside for that. So I think that's very important. Um, the child care center, I think it's like 400 square feet for the child care center. 3,000, wow. 4,000 square feet for a child care center in the, in the facility as well. And so again, I think the thought was around everything that you're talking about. You want to build a community where people want to live, work, and play. And again, when they get home, they have to be home. And the good news is with that transit station out there, I'm hoping that that's going to take the cars off the road for us as well. That miss something? I was paying attention. It was fairly comprehensive. Um, Are we losing the recycle center? Yes, yes, yes. that is that is my yeah. yes. Yeah. The senior, the senior housing going up. I, I won't I won't put someone in the audience on the spot, but if I they want to raise their hand, they can I probably saw, talk so. to you after. Um, yeah, Suki in the back is raising raising her hand, so talk to Suki about the plan for that after. She's our solid waste director. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so yeah. That that question goes to this this young woman in the back there. I know it. It was kind of rhetorical. Yes, yes. Yeah. And you had a question. Well, I think it's a question. And I, in the process of building all of this, you are going to be tearing parts of this down. Logistically, I live in Holiday Estate. I've lived here for over fifty years. 
before the mold, we go through all of that and all the promises that were made, and most of them maybe not kept. Um, tearing up all that asphalt, tearing down all those buildings, has to be hauled away somewhere unless you are repurposing it on site. The noise, the pollution, the wear and tear on all the roads, where does that material actually end up? It's a great question. I mean, really trying to responsibly source waste streams is a big deal these days. Trying to recycle these materials as best as possible, all that asphalt, a lot of it gets milled and, and reused. Um, the good news is, is that a lot of the road and infrastructure remains. Uh, we are giving it a diet. It goes from four lanes to essentially two lanes with the center median, and then we're going to put a bike, bike lane that's separate from that on the inside. So there will be some asphalt that's taken up from that area, but a lot of that will actually be able to stay in place. And it's really in pretty good shape. Um, it was very heavily constructed, knowing that it would receive a lot of traffic when it's originally constructed, and it's really maintained well over time. Now, there will be things that will be taken up. You know, we've got a lot of parking lot, like I said, 20 acres, either roof or asphalt that has to be removed. And so being responsible for those, those streams of waste I mean, some of it has to go to the landfill for sure, but it, it, as much as possible that can be diverted is a benefit. Um, we are looking at some tax things. I can't guarantee anything, but there has been uh, several folks show up in our meetings talking about different types of tax incentives for um, sustainability, and we're looking at all avenues to try and find ways to essentially save cost, but also be responsible with those things. And then on the back end of this, as far as sustainability is concerned, is how do we look at making sure that, um, one, that things last, and that there will be infrastructure for improvements like giving chases in the buildings for solar that is in the future, or providing EV charging stations, which we all know is, is just, you know, really here now, but probably a, a decade from being really, really widespread. Um, and an essential part we see in all of our projects now is demand for EV charging. So, Looking at things like that, trying to be responsible moving forward, uh, there are things like that in this plan. But there will be a lot that, that's going to be tearing to one another that will eventually have to be put somewhere. I'll just add, because you asked where will it go, very likely whatever doesn't get repurposed is going to go to either the Walton or, or, or Oglethorpe County um, landfills, because those are the, the nearest C and D landfills. Um, so Athens Clark County's landfill doesn't take this type of waste, um, so it has to go to one of these other over-the-county landfills. Um, both of those are a fair amount of miles away. So you know, also I will share if anyone in this room has ideas on where these materials can be reused that's closer by, or uh, you know, especially if someone's going to pay for some kind of material, like letting I guess you know Buck or Scott know who those folks might be. I mean, you know, they're looking at. I say pinch pennies, but in this case, those pennies can really add up to a lot of zeros, you know? Um, so if you have any ideas on where waste can be rerouted, um, please definitely let them know. And then, you know, I appreciate that. I think the, the team behind this is gonna do their best to reduce the waste overall, but inevitably there, there will be some amount. I also feel like now maybe a good time to just throw out a plug, since you asked, um, that I'm having a town hall on May 22nd with Suki, who's in the back, and other members of Solid Waste to talk about waste disposal. So any other questions that really want to dive into this, you can talk about it there. I don't know. All right, I'll take uh, one last question. Are these going to be certified buildings? They will not be certified buildings, but um, I think just a, a word on the uh, a lot of our construction standards today are very close to lead standards. A lot of the ways we handle sites are very close to lead standards. They're just not paying for the certification, which is really expensive. Um, I've received lead AP certification probably, gosh, it's been about 12 or 15 years ago. And so I've seen, I've been part of these processes before in certifications, and um, I can tell you that most of the points are achievable by the methods that are being used already, just from the the types of building methodology that's being used today. It's simply the verification process that's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get your, your, your leave. So um, 
although you know it's nice to have that lead, that money is going to be spent in other other ways. I'd rather personally see it be spent on landscaping. But yes. I'm biased. <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank uh, each of our panelists tonight. Give them a, a hand of applause.